Thank you for joining us on a virtual walking tour of Sewickley history. This tour covers almost two miles along the streets and sidewalks of Sewickley's central historic district. Follow along as we explore the history and architecture of Sewickley. We will focus on six buildings that have a Pittsburgh history and landmark society plaque. We also encourage you to get outside and walk the tour yourself. In the video description, there is a downloadable map that you can use. Just be sure to stay on the sidewalk and respect property owners. Be safe and practice social distancing. Before we get started on the walk, let's learn a little bit about Sewickley's history. Our tour guide, Tim Merrill, is a longtime Sewickley resident and docent tour guide with the Pittsburgh History and Landmark Society. Welcome to Sewickley. Dubbed the Queen of Suburbs by G.F. Muller in 1895 when he wrote his first blue book of Swickley Society. He wrote that it was, quote, the most delightful residence spot in western Pennsylvania, end quote. There are three historical districts in Swickley, and today we are going to see the third district that is central to the village, as it's called by its residents. On this tour of commercial and residential neighborhoods in Swickley Borough, we will see excellent examples of many of the architectural styles popular in America in the 19th and early 20th century. The high quality of local housing stock is no accident since a number of nationally and regionally important architects lived and worked in the area, including Frank Alden, Alfred Harlow, Frank Rutan, Frederick Russell, Albert Spar, Henry Gilchrist. We will see six buildings that have a Pittsburgh History and Landmarks, that's PHLF, historic landmark plaques, though there are 22 such plaques in the Swickley Valley. PHLF initiated its program in 1968 to identify architecturally significant structures throughout Allegheny County. Today, there are nearly 600 plaques in western Pennsylvania. Most of the following script comes from the Life of an American Village pamphlets published by PHLF and Swickley celebrates 150 committee in recognition of Swickley Borough's sesquicentennial in 2003. Swickley, of course, is a borough in Pennsylvania, but it's also a catch-all label or phrase for the neighboring boroughs of Glen Osborne, Edgeworth, and Swickley Heights, if not the remaining seven boroughs that make up the Quaker Valley School District. Swickley became a borough in 1853, but its history goes back much further. The Great Road, the Ohio River, and the Railroad all feature in the early history of the Swickley Valley, another catch-all phrase for the area. Though settlement of the area began to occur after the French and Indian War concluded in 1763, not much really happened until Virginia and Pennsylvania ended their dispute in 1779 as to who owned what is now western Pennsylvania. As a result of that deal, a survey of the western bounty of Pennsylvania was made by Andrew Ellicott, the same who laid out Washington, D.C. He started his survey in 1782. 1784, Woods and Vicroy laid out Pittsburgh's grid system. In 1784, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix conveyed the Native American lands north and west of the Allegheny and the Ohio to the newly independent Americans. That north-south elegant line was used as the basis for the surveyors surveying the depreciation lands in 1785 and the western border of Pennsylvania. A survey by Daniel Leet was one of six running through the depreciation lands from west to east. Swickley's Division Street, the only street running north and south, is the eastern boundary of that Leet survey. The Great Road along the northern bank of the Ohio ran from Pittsburgh to Fort McIntosh, located in today's Beaver. Today, Beaver Street and Beaver Road in the neighboring communities follows its course. Once a part of an extensive network of trails laid out by Native Americans, Beaver Road became the major artery connecting Pittsburgh to the Northwest Territory. From the Great Road, we go to the Ohio River. The Ohio River provided water transportation not only between Pittsburgh and Beaver, but also points west. Indeed, in 1803, Lewis and Clark expedition originated in Pittsburgh. 
Flat boats, those boats that went downriver, and keel boats, the boats that went upriver, plied the waterway up until 1811 when Robert Fulton built his first steamboat west of the Alleghenies in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh really became the gateway to the west. Along with the traffic on the Great Road and the steamboats stopping at the landing, settlement began occurring in the flat lands adjacent to the river and a parallel and perpendicular street grid developed. The Presbyterians constructed a log cabin church in 1808 and another more substantial church in 1838 along Beaver Street. However, two noteworthy educational developments really brought respectability and permanence to the community. In 1837, James and Mary Oliver moved their school for young ladies from Braddock to Swickley Bottom. The Edgeworth Female Seminary was named to honor novelist Maria Edgeworth. Also in 1838, an Academy for Boys was founded by John Champ and William Nevin. It exists today as the co-educational Swickley Academy. Students from up and down the river were soon seeking a genteel education in Swickleyville, as residents decided to call their town in 1840. Uh, after dropping the name Contention as a possibility. In 1848, there was a visit by a brand new president, General Zachary Taylor. He was on his way points west, and the ladies of Edgeworth Academy heard he was going to pay a visit, and this is a letter they wrote. Dear General, we wish very much to see you, and delicacy forbids our running to the roadside to gaze upon you whilst passing. Could you not drive into the seminary grounds and pause a few moments in front of the porch. And we will always gratefully remem remember your kindness, that you, of whom we have heard so much during your celebrated career in Mexico, and of whom our fathers and brothers talked hopefully in the recent election time, and now too our president should, be, should pass our gate without our having the privilege of seeing you, would fill us with lasting regret. Do, dear General, permit us to salute you here as you pass, and please convey our compliments to the governor of our commonwealth, who we understand is traveling with you, and we hope to greet him in your company. Yours, respectively, the young ladies of Edgeworth Academy. I'm sure the visit was also made possible by the fact that the wife of the governor of Pennsylvania was a graduate of Edgeworth Academy. But the railroad came in 1851, whereas it took four hours to get to Pittsburgh by the Great Road and two hours by steamboat, now by railroad travel time was less than a half an hour. As they said, the rest is history. We'll commence our walk at the Swickley Presbyterian Church, which has a PHLF plaque. As we walk down Thorn Street, leaving the church, paralleling the river, note this development that is to the riverside of Thorn Street, and it's called the Thorn Farms Neighborhood, founded by Thorn, Bank, Walnut, and Little Streets. It was developed in 1873 of a division of the Thorn Farm. Uh, the plan, the development plan, was called the Sands Ader Plan. The streets are named for the children of the developers. Many of the 91 lots that remain today were sold at auction on one day in 1873, raising $60,000. The resulting accumulation of Victorian vernacular architecture is today part of Swickley's third historic district. You're going to see a lot of Victorian architect along Thorn Street and Walnut Street, most notably Queen Anne Victorian houses. Queen Anne Victorian houses have steep roofs and different kinds of clapboard on the side and ornate porches with spindle work. But we'll also see some Second Empire Victorian houses and we'll see uh, some Colonial Revival uh, Victorian houses. Here's 
used the St. Matthew's AME Zion Church, which you see has a PHLF plaque. Uh, this congregation has been a focus of religion and social life since 1857. The present church is in the vernacular Gothic, possibly adapting ready-made ornamental detailing to its composition. The preceding frame church of 1868 was moved to an adjoining site on Walnut Street, become in 1911 the first African-American YMCA in Swicklick. At the corner of Frederick Street and Walnut is the Atwell Christie House, which has its own PHLF plaque. This Gothic Revival cottage reflects the rustic style developed in the Hudson River Valley by the architect Alexander Jackson Davis with the landscape architect Andrew Jackson Downing. The central gabled entrance blocked with flanking porches is quite characteristic of the house type. The concave roof detailing aside may have been a metal surface originally. Uh, the house was sold in 1869 to, to George Christie, a patent attorney for George Westinghouse, and he added a large kitchen at the back. But look across the street, Frederick Avenue, and see the Hutchison Nettleton House, now the Lachlan Children's Center. Note the similarities between the Christie House and this house. This is also a Victorian cottage of the type popularized by Davis and Downing with the vertical board and batten siding. The letting of the windows is of a later period. The St. Stephen's Parish House, Alden and Harlow were architects. Uh, Alfred Branch Harlow was a St. Stephen's uh, parishioner. Look at that wonderful tower on the St. Stephen's Church with its Celtic cross. Uh, the wall masonry is random ashlar, stones cut in regular shapes but different dimensions. The St. Stephen's Episcopal Church was built in 1894 by Bart Berger in East and expanded by Harlow in 1914-1950. As we walk down Broad Street toward the river, we pass by the David C. Herbst House, which is one of the few Gothic Revival buildings, another Victorian kind of building. This is an odd one in its straight-sided arches with keystone and incised decorations. Unusual, too, is the stone doorway uh, treated in a similar manner, the tall roof in 1913, this building was de dedicated to the first school of St. James Parish with an enrollment of 80 students. Later used as a convent, the building is still owned by the church. The parking lot you see for St. Stephen's once housed the David Nye White House that was built in 1866. What is notable here is that David Nye White was one of the key figures in the formation of the Republican Party. He called for the, one of the first re National Republican Convention in 1856. As we walk down Broad Street, passing by the old post office, which we'll talk about in a minute, we see that Broad Street bends to the left to ultimately hook up with the Swickley Bridge. In 1911, when the Swickley Bridge and the post office were being constructed at the foot of Broad Street, on the river side of the railroad tracks, where you see now the Ohio River Boulevard, uh, there stood in 1911 Park Place Hotel. So they couldn't tear down at that point in time Park Place Hotel and they bent Broad Street so that it lined up with the bridge. Park Place Hotel was raised in 1938, but the bend in the street still remains. As mentioned earlier, in the early 1800s, Swickley became a steamboat town with several steamboat captains re residing here, maybe the last of which was Fred Way Jr., a well-known resident of Swickley who brought the Delta Queen steamboat from San Francisco up the Ohio River in 1946. Whenever the Delta Queen passed by Swickley and other boats, steamboats, 
Uh, they would play Stephen Foster's beautiful dreamer on his calliope in his honor. So you see the Ohio River Boulevard and you don't see the railroad tracks. They were moved from the Ohio River Boulevard site to the river in 1933. And at one point there was a, a two-door style railroad station that was uh, located right on the edge of, again, the Ohio River Boulevard now. Um, this two-door style station built in 1887 was loaded onto railroad flatbed cars and moved to Chadwick Street, earning an entry into Ripley's, believe it or not, for moving a full building. The original Swickley Bridge with two cantilever trusses was a suspended ban and, as I said, opened in 1911. The present bridge, a continuous truss, repeats the silhouette of the original bridge. Finials from the original bridge have been saved and are in two places in Sewickley, Park Place, which you see at the corner of Bank and Walnut, and at Chadwick and Chestnut Street. The old Swickley Post Office, with its own PHLF plaque, was built 1910-1911. It's a Bose Arts edifice. The entrance is Swickley. It was the federal presence of the U.S. Post Office. And it's one of the few buildings that has the United States of America printed on its side. The building now houses the Sweetwater Center for the Arts and the Swickley Valley Historical Society. Just up the hill on Broad Street from the post office is the Alice Wood Tyndall House. Henry Gilchrist built that in 1910. It's very unusual to see a fully slate-hung house in the Pittsburgh area. There are slate-hung dormers here and there on Swickley houses, but no walls covered with slate. The house looks simple and rugged with such a siding and its prominent gables. As we continue walking back up Broad Street, we'll pass other Queen Anne's houses and Victorian vernacular houses. The oldest house on Broad Street it's 254, and it was built by uh, Henry Gilchrist. As I said, it was the home of the architect, Henry Gilchrist. If we look across the street toward the west side of the street, we see a Rutan and Russell house, and we see the Swickley Methodist Episcopal Church. Today, the Swickley United Methodist Church, which was built in 1884. The steeple tower is perhaps the most visible landmark in Swickley, and I call it the iconic structure of Swickley. The original clock of 1884 was purchased from the Howard Clock Company of Boston and cost a thousand bucks. It has been struck by lightning many times and now has its own sprinkler system. But I want to read to you from Agnes Ellis's The Lights and Shadows of Swickley Life or Memories of Sweet Valley that was written in 1891. That which comes to me now is a work that will be a lasting monument to his memory. Had he done nothing else is the town clock, which his energy and liberality placed in the tower of the new Methodist church. As the spire points us heavenward to the land beyond the clouds, how fitting that our eyes returning to earth should see the hands pointing out the hour, reminding us of the days of probation in which to prepare for that land beyond time and space are hastening on. We come now to the Swickley Public Library with its own PHLF plaque, originally built in 1923 by Henry Gilchrist. Uh, and further addition by Gonzola and Associates in 1999. Swickley Public Library owes its beginning to the arrival of a whiskey boat at Saw Mill landing on a Saturday evening in late 1872. Disorder erupted, prompting a small group of young men from the borough to look for a more proper and rational amusement. In 1873, the Young Men's Library Association was formed and rented a room in Mozart Hall for the town's first library services. The library was 
one of the oldest community libraries in western Pennsylvania. In 1923, Mr. William Klaus, the president of Pittsburgh Plate Glass, gave this building to the town of Swickley in memory of his wife. If we look across the street, we see a number of commercial stores, but on that site is a long gone Richard Romanesque yellow brick school building that dominated downtown Swickley for many years. Further east is the Municipal Hall uh, at the corner of Chestnut and Thorn Streets, which is also a 1911 structure. The Flatiron Building up on Division and Beaver, uh, also with a PHLF plaque, was built in 1875 whose name derives from a New York building similarly sited and shaped. For many years, this building was the headquarters of the Swickley Herald, the town's newspaper founded in 1903. The buildings in the Swickley Commercial District are visually uni unified by their modest size and scale and general character. Though they show a variety of styles, in Greek Revival, Italianate, Tudor, and Art Deco. The oldest one is the frame Hegner building at 445 uh, Beaver, circa 1850. The Swickley Valley Trust Bank, now PNC, at the corner of Blackburn and Beaver, is a 1902 work of Rutan and Russell, and is unusually bold in its brickwork and terracotta ornamentation. Swickley Presbyterian Church also has a PHLF plaque, originally built in 1859 to 1861. It was added onto by Rutan and Russell in 1914. It's a Gothic Revival church that was the work of William Kerr, a noted Pittsburgh architect. It was one of the first Presbyterian churches to be built in the Basilica style, and one of the first Presbyterian churches to have five different artists with three major types of stained glass windows. Uh, the church has two John Lafarge stained glass windows. There's only one other Lafarge window in Pittsburgh, and that's a, in the Frick Building downtown. One of Lafarge's students was Louis, Louis Comfort Tiffany, and Tiffany really popularized opalescence or American stained glass. Churches all over the country have Tiffany windows. The Presbyterian Church is fortunate to have seven of them. But then there arose a contra style, as always often happens in our country, and architects who were building uh, neo-Gothic uh, buildings, the opalescent windows detracted from their architecture, and they went back to a more of a neo-medieval uh, stained glass. Uh, one of the developers of this neo-Gothic was Charles Connick, and the big window at the back of the Presbyterian Church is a conic window. The contrast between these three styles, the conic, the Lafarge, and the Tiffany, is just short of fantastic. That concludes our virtual walking tour. Be sure to check our website and social media channels for information about upcoming virtual programs and services we provide.